Saints are supposed to be the good guys, but it turns out someone can dabble in murder, kidnapping, genocide, even kill their own family, and still have time to straighten up and become a saint. Between the ages of 30 and 33, Saul of Tarsus, also known as Paul, was busy leading the crusade against early Christians. He got his hands dirty doing it, too. In Acts 8, 1-3, he's described as going from house to house through the city of Jerusalem, looking for members of the local Christian church so he could send them to prison. What happened next was nothing short of awful. Anyone Saul found to be a blasphemer was stoned to death, including Christianity's first martyr, St. Stephen. Stephen had the ability to perform miracles, but he couldn't save his own life. As he was dragged through the streets in stone, the executioners laid their coats at Saul's feet. After Stephen's execution, Saul took his show on the road. He headed to Damascus to bring the same fire and brimstone to a whole new population of Christians. Fortunately for them, Christ appeared to Saul on the outskirts of the city, and the killer was converted. The name Olaf is pretty popular for a Viking, so let's get specific and talk about Olaf II. He lived from 995 to 1030, and in addition to being a saint, he was also king of Norway. He's credited with the nation's conversion to Christianity, and he was also a bloodthirsty Viking. Olaf began raiding and pillaging when he was just 12 years old. Favorite targets included Holland and England, where he made it clear what he thought of religion. Olaf was about to set his sights on Jerusalem when he had a vision and headed to Norway. There, he announced that he was now king and was going to show pagans the path to salvation via Christianity. If your people agree to the sacrament of baptism and willingly renounce their pagan past, we are willing to spare your city. While he did good things like building churches, he also executed those he found still holding harvest feasts and celebrating Yule. His forced conversions made him incredibly unpopular. After losing control of the country, he died in 1030 during an attempt to reclaim the throne. By then, Christianity had a firm foothold in Norway, and Olaf was declared a saint just a year after he was killed, or as the story goes, martyred by non-believers. When Kiev's Grand Prince Svatoslav Igorovich died in 977, he left three sons, Oleg, Yaropolk, and Vladimir. While the older two fought for the crown, Vladimir headed off to Norway, raised an army, then returned to carve a bloody path to what was now Yaropolk's kingdom. When he reached his brother's stronghold, he killed him, then forced Yaropolk's betrothed to become his wife and raped her in front of her parents. It's worth noting that she was just one of a slew of women in Vladimir's life. He had several concubines, around 800 of them, along with a slew of wives. So how the heck did he become the holy great Prince Vladimir, equal to the apostles, the patron saint of Ukraine and Russia? Vladimir was determined to unite his kingdom and decided religion was the way to go. His earliest attempts involved taking the deities of various tribes and turning them into a sort of national pagan religion, with a thunder god named Perun at the top. When that didn't work, he decided to try again with a new upstart religion, Christianity. After being baptized in 988, he kicked off a campaign of conversion or else, and built churches even as he destroyed all traces of pagan worship. All that earlier murder and stuff became proof of God's forgiveness, and Vladimir became a saint. That whole forgive and forget thing? It wasn't in St. Columkill's playbook. St. Columkill is one of Ireland's three patron saints, along with Patrick and Brigid, but his story is a little more bloody than the others. Columkill lived in the 6th century. He started out as a monk, but he went rogue and copied a book of Psalms without permission from his teacher. Things went sideways, and the dispute went all the way to the king. The king sided with Columkill's teacher, but what's a monk to do? Columkill started a war. He went to the people of Connaught and Clan Nell and suggested the king needed to be taken down a peg. This ended up kicking off the Battle of Col Dremna, where thousands of men were slaughtered, but legend said only one person on the side of Columkill. He felt so guilty about the slaughter that he went into self-imposed exile, promising to convert as many people as he killed. Around the year 945, in an area now known as Ukraine, Prince Igor I was captured by a rival tribe. He may or may not have been tied to two tree trunks and ripped in half. Either way, he was murdered. Then his killers had the nerve to go to his widow, now the first female ruler of her tribe, Olga, with a proposal to marry their leader. She responded politely, then buried them alive. And that was just the beginning. She invited the rival tribe to her husband's funeral feast, fed them well, then killed all 5,000 of them. But wait, there's more. Olga agreed to make peace in exchange for a tribute, three pigeons and three sparrows collected from each home in the city. When she got the birds, she tied lit sulfur cloths to each one and released them. They flew home to roost and set fire to the entire city in the process. Those who escaped were captured and enslaved. After Olga got her revenge, Emperor Constantine decided he wanted to marry her. Olga thought fast, converted to Christianity, and asked him to baptize her. This made them spiritually linked, and the church forbade people from marrying their goddaughter. So the newly Christian and safely single Olga went home to rule and became a champion of her new religion. 
History paints Father Junipero Serra as a kindly Franciscan monk who headed to California in 1769 with the goal of protecting and aiding the native people, who were being subjected to horrible abuses at the hands of the Spanish. Serra spearheaded a movement to bring tens of thousands of people into Catholic missions that one generous account describes as places where people could get a hearty meal and worship Christ. But that's not the whole story. Historian Kerry McWilliams wrote that they were more like a series of picturesque charnel houses. Native Americans were used by the missions as a source of slave labor. Families were separated and restricted to living quarters where disease was rampant. They were beaten for trying to leave. It's documented that he wanted the Indian languages suppressed. It's documented that he um, sent for whips um, for Indian people to be whipped. The 2015 canonization of Junipero Serra brought to light some terrible statistics. For example, more people died on Sarah's watch than were born during it. Some say Sarah stepped into an impossible situation that there was no way to make life bearable for those living under the boot heel of the Spanish. But Sarah and his fellow missionaries committed cultural genocide, destroying the indigenous people's entire way of life. It's definitely not a good look for a so-called saint. Moses started out as a slave in the home of a government official, but according to Christian chronicler Palladius of Galatea, his own master drove him out because of his immorality and brigandage where he was said to go even the length of murder. Once he was out on the street, Moses didn't immediately change his ways. Instead, he fell in with a gang known for terrorizing the entire area with a constant threat of murder, robbery, and countless other violent crimes. When one of his deadly schemes was interrupted by a shepherd, he plotted his revenge, searched for the man, and instead found himself at a local monastery. Enamored with the life of the monks he met there, he repented and insisted that he be allowed to join them. They eventually agreed. And when Moses' murderous band tracked him down, he converted them all and convinced them too to become monks. They lived at the monastery for years until the now 75-year-old Moses sent his disciples away to protect them from an imminent attack from a group of murderous thieves, much like he had once led. He was killed in the attack and is now one of the patron saints of nonviolence. Bartolo Longo isn't technically a saint, not yet, but he's only one step away from full sainthood. In addition to earning the title of Blessed and other saintly descriptions, Logo was given a feast day, October 5th, and called an Apostle of the Rosary. The guy has come a long way from the time he spent as a satanic priest. Longo was born in 1841, and although he was raised in a Catholic family, his faith faltered after the death of his mother. Add in the distinctly anti-Catholic environment he found himself in while at the University of Naples, and he would later write, I was ensnared on the enticing hook of freedom of conscience and thought, seduced by the novelties of science. Longo jumped feet first into the world of spiritualism, the occult, and finally into everything from orgies to satanic rituals. He went so deep into the occult that he believed himself possessed by a demon to whom he had promised his soul. And when the person is manifesting a demonic presence, the first thing that happens is you've got this incredible evil look. Understandably, this development sent him into a period of deep depression and anxiety. His devotion to the devil ended when he heard his father tell him to return to God, so he got up and did. With guidance from a Dominican priest, Longo became a lay brother named Brother Rosario, married Countess Mariana de Fusco, which he could do because he technically wasn't a priest, and restored Pompey's Our Lady of the Rosary Shrine. St. Augustine might be a respected church father, and therefore the idea of reading his confessions might seem so boring it'd be preferable to just get a few teeth pulled. But hang on, his confessions are actually something on a whole other level. The New Yorker claims that this particular saint invented sex, and while that might be a bit of an exaggeration, it's not by much. Augustine wrote about some pretty lurid affairs, and while things like having a child outside of wedlock might not rock our 21st century sensibilities, there's no denying that he treated the women he professed to love pretty badly. After almost two decades of sampling all the pleasures of the flesh the world had to offer, Augustine settled down with a woman who bore a son. He records his son's name, a Deodontus, but never hers. The two never married, and when he refused to make things legal on multiple occasions, she left. It was enough to make Augustine wonder if there was something to this marriage thing after all. But before he could marry the younger woman who'd been promised to him, he took advantage of the time to hook up with a few, or many, more women. By now, Augustine was in his 30s, but he needed to wait until his intended bride was old enough to legally marry. And on top of that, Augustine's behavior was so bad that even his mother intervened and asked him to please, please, please stop seducing married women. In other words, for a saint, that guy was no saint. But somehow he found time to read and picked up a book of St. Paul's writings that prompted some self-reflection. Soon after, Augustine and his son were baptized, and he set out to spread God's word, revisiting his old life only long enough to write about it for posterity. 
St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers, an association he got for carrying a child who was Christ in disguise safely across a river. Admittedly, Christopher has what the Los Angeles Times calls wobbly historical status. There is nothing in the scriptures to say that he did. And there's nothing in the scriptures to say that he did not. It's not certain whether or not he was based on a real person or invented by medieval monks, but he's still one of Catholicism's go-to saints. As the story goes, Christopher's given name was Reprobus, which essentially meant rejected. He was said to be a giant who thought only the most powerful person in the world was worthy of his strength and service. That was originally a Canaanite king, but when Reprobus learned that the king was afraid of the devil, he decided to serve this devil fellow instead, and he did. It wasn't until he met a bandit who wouldn't go near or defile a crucifix that he decided this Jesus guy must be even more powerful, so he switched teams once again. It was while he was doing the bidding of a hermit and ferrying people across the river that he met Christ and was given his name, which means Christ-bearer. 